Professor Said is not only a literary theorist. He is also a very prominent and active representative of the Palestinian people. Said grew up in what was then called Palestine and is now called Israel and the Occupied Territories. When the State of Israel was founded in 1948, like millions of other Palestinians, Said and his family were made homeless as well as stateless. These exiled Palestinians now mostly live either in the territories under the control of Israel or in refugee camps in the surrounding countries. One of the things that drives Said is the quest for justice and a homeland for the Palestinian people. And there's a close connection between Said's intellectual work and his political activism. As he himself remarks, he wrote three books that he thinks of as a trilogy and that in his mind are closely connected together. Orientalism, covering Islam, and the question of Palestine. He believes that finding a peaceful, humane, and just solution to the conflicts in the Middle East, that is, finding an answer to the question of Palestine, will require overcoming the racist legacy of Orientalism that stresses the separation of people from each other, that regards difference as a threat that must be contained or destroyed. Because of the complex and bloody history of the Middle East, Said regards the situation in Palestine and Israel as the ultimate test case facing the 21st century of whether we live together in peace and reconciliation with our differences or whether we live apart in fear and loathing of each other, constantly under threat, constantly at war. In seeking a way out of this legacy of mistrust and conflict, Said draws upon the work of Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci, who gives us the tools to think about these difficult issues in more productive and humane ways. Well, Gramsci in the prison notebooks says something that has always tremendously appealed to me, that history deposits in, in us our own history, our family's history, our nation's history, our tradition's history, which has left in us an uh, infinity of traces, all kinds of marks, you know, through heredity, through collective experience, through individual experience, through family experience, through relations between one individual and another, a whole uh, book, if you like, uh, a series of an infinity of traces, but there's no inventory, there's no, there's no orderly guide to it. You know? So Gramsci says, therefore the task at the outset is to try to compile an inventory, in other words, to try and make sense of it. And this seems to me, to me at any rate, to be the, the, the most interesting sort of human task. It's the task of interpretation. Uh, it's a task of giving history some shape and sense for a particular reason, not just the, you know, to show that my history is better than yours or my history is worse than yours. I'm a victim and you're uh, somebody who's oppressed people and so on. But rather to understand my history in terms of other people's history. In other words, to try to understand, to, general, to move beyond, to generalize one's own individual experience to the experience of others. And I think, um, I think the great... Uh, goal is in fact to become someone else, to transform itself from a unitary identity to an identity that includes the other without suppressing the difference. That, he says, is the great goal. And, 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 and for me, I think, I think that, that would be the case, you know. Uh, and that would be the, the notion of writing an inventory, a uh, historical inventory, which right, not only understand oneself, but understand oneself in relation to others, and to understand others as if you would understand yourself. Palestine is so important in this respect um, because of its local uh, complexities, that is to say, Arabs and Jews, Arab Muslims and Arab Christians and, and Israeli Jews, of themselves very mixed backgrounds. I mean, we're talking about Polish Jews, Russian Jews, American Jews, Yemeni Jews, Iraqi Jews, Indian Jews. It's a, it's a fairly complex mosaic, somehow finding a way to live together on a land that is drenched, saturated with significance on a world scale, unlike any other country in the world. I mean, it's holy to three of the major religions, and every inch of it has been combed over and fought over for the last several thousand years. And the pattern so far has been the Zionist pattern, which is to say that, you know, it was promised to us, we're the chosen people, everybody else is sort of second rate, throw them out or treat them as second class citizens. And 
In contrast to that, uh, some of us, not everybody, but many Palestinians have said, well, we realize that we are being asked to pay the price for what happened to the Jews in Europe under the Holocaust. It was an entirely Christian and European catastrophe in which the Arabs played no part. And we are being dispossessed, displaced by, our, uh, by the victims. We've become the victims of the victims. But as I say, not all of us say, well, they should be thrown out because we have been thrown out, and so we have another vision, which is a vision of coexistence in which Jew and Arab, Muslim, Christian, and, and Jew, can live together in some polity, which I think it requires a kind of cr creativity and, and invention uh, that is possible, vision, um, that would replace the authoritarian hierarchical model. But this idea that somehow we should protect ourselves against the infiltrations, the infections of the other, is, I think, the most dangerous idea uh, at the end of the 20th, 20th century. And uh, unless we find ways to do it, and there are no, there are no shortcuts to it, um, unless we find ways to do this, I, you know, there's going to be wholesale violence of the sort uh, represented by the Gulf War, by the killings in Bosnia, the Rwandan massacres, and so on. I mean, those are the pattern. Uh, of emerging conflict that is extremely dangerous and needs to be th counteracted. And, and I think, therefore, it's correct to say that the challenge now is, is the challenge. I, I, I wouldn't call it um, anything other than coexistence. How, do, how does one coexist with people whose religions are different, whose uh, traditions and languages are different, but who, are, who form part of the same community or polity in a national sense? Uh, how do we accept difference without violence and hostility. I've been interested in a field called comparative literature most all of my adult life. And com the, the ideal of comparative literature is not to show how English literature is really a secondary phenomenon in French literature or Arabic literature is, you know, a kind of poor cousin to Persian literature or any of those silly things, but to show them existing, you might say, as contrapuntal lines in a great composition by which difference is respected and understood without, uh, without coercion. And it's that attitude, I think, that we need.